Good evening, and welcome to the Iridex Corporation webinar series discussing micropulse transcleral laser therapy. My name is Kevin LaMarche, Director of Glaucoma Marketing and Clinical Education at Iridex, and I will be your moderator this evening. All participants will be muted throughout the webinar to ensure clarity of our broadcast. Any questions you may have must be submitted through the chat function within the Zoom app. Tonight, we are privileged to be joined by Sandra Fernando Semensky, Director of Glaucoma Services at the University of Buffalo, and Cyril Dorage, Professor of Ophthalmology, Jacksonville, Florida. They will be discussing their original study, Outcomes of Micropulse Transcleral Cyclophotocoagulation in Eyes with Good Central Vision. Following their presentation, Dr. Semensky and Dr. Dorage will be available for any questions you may have. Remember, all questions must be submitted through the chat function within the Zoom app. The webinar, along with all of our past webinars, are available for review on Iridex's corporate website. I will now hand over the podium to Dr. Siminski and Dr. Duraj. Good evening, and uh, thanks everyone for joining us tonight. Um, Cyril, Dr. Doriarge, and I are very excited to be sharing with you um, our paper, which we hope you have already taken a look at. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's been exciting for a lot of um, people to hear that um, this technology can be applied to patients with good central vision, and that was the question uh, we wanted to uh, um, explore and answer in our paper. Um, so, as you know, uh, micropulse um, transcleral laser therapy or micropulse transcleral cyclophotocoagulation, um, the, new, uh, the new terminology of micropulse transcleral laser therapy um, is just a, a reminder to us that it is different from the traditional CPC, um, is something that's been out for uh, several years. Uh, but definitely there's been a lot of um, resistance to be applying this technology uh, to patients uh, with potentially good vision or in the earlier stages of glaucoma uh, as opposed to end-stage uh, glaucoma. So the current body of literature that we have thus far uh, definitely demonstrates the safety and efficacy of the, um, of the therapy. However, uh, up until our study, there was not a study that was solely performed in those patients with good vision at baseline. And that was our patient population uh, that we looked at. And this is just a, a look at our paper, uh, the, the front safety abstract, um, which came out in the Journal of Glaucoma last year. Um, and like I said, this was a paper or a project that actually was solely looking at patients with glaucoma who had a visual acuity of greater than or equal to uh, 2060. Um, so we were looking at those patients alone. And this was a collaboration between the University of Buffalo and uh, Mayo Jacksonville with Dr. Dory Raj and his team. Uh, looking at patients retrospectively between July 2016 and August 2017. We included, of course, patients with 2060 vision or better at baseline with a minimal, minimum of three months follow-up, but as you will see, most of our patients were followed up to 12 months. Uh, there wasn't much of an exclusion criteria. You'll see that we looked at many different types of glaucoma, primarily primary open angle glaucoma. Um, but we did exclude patients with a history of ocular trauma or congenital anterior chamber anomalies. Our primary outcome measures were IOP, glaucoma medication reduction, and visual acuity. And our complete success was eyes with an IOP of either 6 to 21 millimeters of mercury or had a reduction of uh, intraocular pressure of greater than or equal to 20% from baseline and also who, eyes who lost less than or equal to two lines of vision without need for reoperation. Qualified success was the same as above, but those patients lost more than two lines uh, or, of vision from baseline. We included 61 eyes in our study of 46 patients. The mean age was 68.8, with a mean follow-up of 10.2 months. 
And a majority of our patients, which is also um, interesting and also the topic of another study um, that we are in the process of publishing, is that our patients, in the majority of our patients did not have a history of incisional glaucoma surgery, which is pretty unique when you look at the body of literature uh, preceding our study. So this is a breakdown of our patients looking at race of primarily Caucasian population, primarily open angle glaucoma, primarily pseudophagic. Uh, many of them had a history of SLT, um, but again, a majority of them had no prior incisional glaucoma surgery, which is quite unique when you look at some of the, um, of the literature about uh, micropulse CPC. Um, our surgical technique, uh, we pretty much follow the industry standards for the surgical technique, which is a standard power or a, uh, um, uh, a stable power of 2,000 milliwatts with a duty cycle of 31.33%. So that was a parameter we didn't change at all. Um, in terms of the time or duration of the laser probe application, um, there was a slight variation in this, in general, about 80 seconds per hemifield. Um, you can see there was a little bit of variation in those uh, total duration in the superior and inferior hemifields. The other parameter that was kept constant was the dwell time, so how long the probe was swept across the hemifield, which was 10 seconds per hemifield. We did mention in our paper there was a bit of an adjustment based on iris color of the patient. I would say this variation was very little because we did maintain a stable power of 2,000 milliwatts and the uh, stable dwell time, or unchanging dwell time, but there was a bit of variation on um, the amount of uh, time that the laser was applied per hemifield. Again, varied by a, a total of uh, maximum seven seconds. And this was uh, sort of incorporating a concept, potentially like SLT, if there's a lot of pigment of the iris, potentially you could use less power um, with the probe. But again, this variation was very minimal. So let's look at the results. So we first will look at the IOP, which was significantly reduced from baseline at all time points, months one, three, six, and 12. And an IOP reduction of greater than or equal to 20% from baseline was seen in 44 eyes at month one, 55 eyes at month uh, three, 50 eyes at month six. And I just bolded our final follow-up, which again which was a majority of our patients made it to the 12-month post-op visit, and 85% of them um, which achieved this IOP reduction of greater than or equal to 20%. In terms of medications, again, ev at every time point of follow-up, the number of glaucoma medications was significantly reduced from baseline. And the glaucoma medication was reduced by greater than or equal, than, greater than or equal to one medication from baseline in a majority of pa patients at all time points. Again, I bolded the month 12, so 79, almost 80% of patients reduce their glaucoma medications by greater than or equal to one medication at the final time point. In terms of visual acuity, at each time point, there was no significant reduction in logmar best corrected visual acuity from baseline. Of the 49 eyes that were followed to 12 months postoperatively, which was not all of them, but a majority of the patients, a total of 10 eyes were found to have lost greater than or equal to two lines of vision, with four, lines, four eyes losing equal to two lines of vision, and six eyes, or 12.5%, losing greater than two lines. So if we're thinking about truly significant vision loss of greater than two lines, I bolded that of a percentage of 12.5%, or six eyes, of our total of 49 eyes that made it to the 12-month follow-up. This is kind of a breakdown. Uh, we talked a lot about the 20% reduction, but this slide sort of demonstrates to you the mean um, uh, intraocular pressure at baseline of 25.69 um, millimeters of mercury down to 15.45 at month 12. And I just highlighted the percent uh, IOP decrease at month 12, which was 40%. 
Um, I also bolded the number of medication decrease um, at, at the follow-up, which is about um, uh, uh, the average of 0.82 or about one uh, glaucoma med decrease. And then the Logmar visual acuity is in the bottom panel, um, and it does demonstrate at our month 12 the, um, the rate of 20.83% with the greater than or equal to loss of two lines. So why do we have this vision loss? What is the breakdown of these patients, uh, these 10 patients? So five of them had cataract progression. They did under, undergo cataract uh, extraction after the study completion. Whether or not the, uh, the laser therapy itself actually caused a, an acceleration of the cataract formation um, is unclear. It's, it's very possible. Um, but their visual acuity went back to baseline after uh, the cataract extraction. One eye had a previous history of CME prior to receiving the laser and developed CME after uh, the, the uh, therapy as well. Two eyes had a history of iritis, which resolved at the, the study completion. And only two could we not find a true explainable cause of the vision loss. We attributed it to glaucoma progression. And the breakdown is shown there of the two patients, one having a progression of their field and the other one having an unreliable field. Uh, I feel like this is an important slide when we really think about the complications we can have from other incisional glaucoma surgeries and, of course, traditional CPC. If you look at the papers um, involving uh, diode CPC, there's a lot of sympathetic ophthalmia, tysis. Um, and, uh, and the like. So we do like to point out, and I put a box around um, the fact that there were no patients that had um, devastating um, complications after micropulse. So in terms of our complete success, we had um, a very high rate of complete success. Again, these are patients with a pressure of 6 to 21 or greater than 20% uh, IOP reduction from baseline with a less than uh, um, a two lines of vision loss. And our qualified success rate is, uh, of course, higher um, and was statistically different from baseline to all of these follow-up visits. And uh, this is our um, survival curve for complete and qualified success. So um, when we wrote the paper, we were asked by the reviewers to actually do a subgroup analysis on patients, um, separating patients who had previous glaucoma surgery and those who did not. 15 of those eyes had no previous glaucoma surgery compared to 46 eyes that had undergone previous glaucoma surgery. There was a significant improvement in IOP and glaucoma medication use at, in both groups at all time points. And at month 12, the mean visual acuity was significantly reduced in patients with prior glaucoma surgery, but was not significantly reduced in those with primary uh, micropulse. I would like to point out, I did mention before, 75% of patients did not have um, incisional glaucoma surgery. This figure here of 15 eyes included SLT and ALT, which is why uh, it's much smaller. And this is a table looking at the subgroup analysis again, looking at the patients with no prior glaucoma surgery, showing a significant reduction in IOP medications at all time points, and also um, uh, no significant um, uh, visual acuity decrease at uh, different time points. So a different uh, rate of visual acuity loss compared to those who had glaucoma surgery prior. So we showed a, a statistically significant reduction in IOP and glaucoma medication use at every time point compared to baseline, and no statistically significant reduction in vision at any time point compared to baseline. These are some of the previous studies looking at micropulse uh, CPC. Um, I'd like to point out a similar mean IOP reduction 
as many of these studies in a similar mean IOP, I'm sorry, uh, medication reduction use. Um, in terms of the loss of vision, there is quite a wide range, some of the studies not including the loss of vision, um, with a rate of up to 26.2%, so a very um, broad range um, of patients. I would like to point out a lot of these studies, though, included patients with very um, uh, severe glaucoma and pretty poor vision um, at baseline compared to our study. Um, so just looking back at some of the studies that sort of uh, launched uh, Micropulse, this um, one of these uh, uh, studies was one done by uh, Dr. Aquino in 2015, um, randomizing patients to Micropulse versus continuous wave CPC, um, 24 in each study, just looking at the efficacy of IOP reduction. And uh, they found a um, higher or a greater IOP reduction um, and a rate, a greater rate of IOP reduction of 30% or more in patients with micropulse compared to continuous wave. Um, in terms of efficacy compared to um, uh, the TVT study, for example, uh, there was a 51 and 50% reduction from baseline IOP in the tube and TRAG group, respectively, at one-year follow-up. And again, at our one-year follow-up, we had 40% uh, percent, 40.2%, and other studies have shown even higher rates of IOP reduction. When talking about safety, um, the rate of vision loss of greater than two lines after micropulse has ranged uh, quite high as we looked at that slide with the previous study. Uh, and our rate of 20.83 is comparable as it is within this range. Um, and uh, it, I, I would say, again, our uh, vision loss too is, might be a bit unique because we started out uh, with patients that had better vision at baseline compared to some of the previous studies. Uh, in terms of safety, uh, we did talk about, uh, we still talking about uh, visual acuity loss. There are comparable rates when we think about TRABs and tubes. Uh, again, going back to the TVT study, um, there is a 32 and 33% uh, vision loss uh, reported in this study of greater than or equal to two lines um, at one year. And our study had, again, uh, a less lesser rate than this, and I'd like to again point out that we had no cases of tysis, and ophthalmitis, sympathetic ophthalmia, or vitreous hemorrhage, which um, can be obviously seen in tubes and traps. Uh, we did talk about the high rate of cataract progression amongst our patients, um, at least the patients that had uh, significant vision loss, cataract was uh, one factor that accounted for many of them. So we did ha see a, a high rate of 40%. And this is uh, something that I think is very important to bring up with your fake patients and consider um, if you are uh, consenting the patient. Um, so uh, it's the one of the advantage um, the advantages of the micropulse is that uh, it can be considered as a primary procedure. As I mentioned before, 75% of our patients did not have a history of incisional glaucoma surgery. These patients actually did um, quite well. They, had, um, uh, they did have a bit of vision loss that's similar to our overall rate. So 21 compared to 20.83%, but in terms of uh, IOP lowering, uh, their rate was uh, uh, better than those who had incisional glaucoma surgery in their history. Some advantages, of course, compared to doing incisional surgery is that you don't necessarily need a sterile operating room, uh, although um, in my practice, I do do the surgery and the, the procedure in the operating room for um, uh, the presence of the anesthesiologist. It provides less post-operative activity restriction. As you know, you have a lot of limitations uh, for your patients after, particularly TRAB, 
in terms of activity restrictions, showering, um, exercise, things like that. Uh, there's virtually no risk of infection um, with the micropolitan. Of course, it's portable. You can take it to other locations um, uh, pretty easily. Uh, limitations of our study, obviously, the, the limited sample size, uh, the lack of a comparative group. Um, for example, one the uh, group that had a visional surgery, um, and it was of course a retrospective study, so we, we don't have prospective data in this group. Uh, relatively short follow-up duration, although we did have a year um, of, of follow-up in most of the patients. So in conclusion, a micropulse should be considered earlier in the management of glaucoma and can possibly be offered as an alternative to incisional glaucoma surgery. I think our paper definitely um, opened up some possibilities to bring micropulse um, into uh, the armamentarium of glaucoma uh, management. Um, potentially, with patients with good central vision, it could be an alternative to incisional glaucoma surgery if a patient is in need of something more uh, than um, glaucoma medication. Thank you. Okay, uh, Dr. Duraj. Sandy, like you. Sandy, you kind of uh, summarized our paper very well. The, the two major points that you kind of brought up is that micropulse transfer laser therapy should be considered as an earlier management option for patients with glaucoma and also offered as an alternative for incisional glaucoma surgeries. But conventionally, if you see the data that's been published since last 40, 50 years, these incisional surgeries are always offered to patients who are progressing. Progressing in the sense who are losing vision, they're in the extent to going blind. So per our regulations, what we consider severe progressive glaucoma is somebody who's losing more than 1.5 decibel of uh, visual field loss per year. So when you consider that group, like you know, when the studies that kind of like collaborative initial uh, glaucoma treatment study which compared the medication with trabeclectomy with the TVT study. This is very unique in the sense like we offered it to patients who had good vision. That is the one point. The, though it seems risky, what was comparable is getting an outcome of IOP reduction and also safety far superior than the incisional glaucoma surgery. That is the main outcome. So according to the WGA, uh, World Glaucoma Association consensus that came, like, you know, we had this last year, we kind of like had few points to consider surgical success. For a surgeon, there should be IOP endpoint and then medication usage, two points, right? So IOP endpoints and medication usage. If you compare it in our study, both are excellent. When compare it to like a traps or tubes, these are excellent. But the other major point, what we have to reiterate is the complications. And also like how many patients that we took back for a reoperation. So when you see that rate, when you see like 33 to 40% in those studies to something like 20% here, it's beyond comparison. But I agree that like we need more studies, more randomized controlled trials to compare with those uh, incisional surgery. But this is an initial kind of like a thought provoking study where this therapy can be offered in patients who are progressing, but still they have a great central vision. But when you, so let's, when you look at patients' perspective, so what do the patients want? So what patients want is consistent lowering of IOP, low morbidity and discomfort. When you compare it with traps and tube, there's no way comparison for low morbidity and then discomfort from this and then good cosmetic outcome, and then minimum or no impact on their day-to-day -day activities. ADL should not be affected. So like it's a given point. So conventionally, like 30 years back when I started doing cyclophotocoagulation, we would offer it to patients who, who underwent everything as like, as you were saying, incisional surgeries, everything is failed, then we would offer it to those patients. But still like if you look at those patients, 
you know, the complications were far higher. So recently the paper that uh, Parth published in from Journal of Glaucoma, he kind of like offered it to patients who had cytophotochloridation with central good vision. But what he noticed is almost 33% of his patients had persistent inflammation and of, of which CME was the major cause. But in our patient population, what we noticed is very distinctly just one patient. But the other point that you brought up is in our patient population is cataract. Cataract. So out of 20%, almost like 12% of our patients had cataract. But if you look at the average age of our patient population is somewhere like around 68, right? Somewhere around 68. But if you take the average age of patients undergoing cataract surgery in the United States, according to my clinic study, is somewhere around 65. So they already had some sort of like cataract undergoing, but we didn't notice very significant iritis or anything in this patient population. But it remains to be seen, possibly by some prospective studies, why these patients, as you said, develop two lines loss of fusion. But what is more important is once those patients underwent cataract surgery, five of them retained their vision back. So these are all like very important points that we need to like consider when we are offering it to our patients. You know, patients who are progressing and you know, patients who have cataracts. So like I would be a little more cautious. So that is the main thing that I wanted to bring it up. So, you know, timing of offering this kind of surgeries, especially before you offer any kind of incisional surgeries, can you offer it as an alternative? And that's what we tried proving it in our study. And when you look at all the other things, quality of life, age, and the other economic factors, cost effectiveness, all this, when you bring it, it's beyond comparison. It's beyond comparison to the, even the TVT study that you quoted or even the collaborative initial glaucoma treatment study that you kind of like compare. So IOP lowering or even complications, vision stability, all this is beyond comparison from those studies. So uh, the main other thing that you brought up is the consistency. Like I know, like we just looked into one year, but if you look at the treatment failures after five years in the tube study, tube versus trap, almost 33% of tube study in five years failed. Uh, and then in almost 50% of trabeclectomy group failed in the TVT study. So almost 50% who underwent TRAB in the TVT study in five years failed. So it remains to be seen, like you know, our, uh, our patient population with such good central vision, if we can just like follow up and keep them safe, they can continue their day-to-day -day activities and then all those things makes a huge difference in our patient population. So, uh, you know, that brings us uh, to my uh, practice. To, you know, I used to do a lot of uh, incisional surgeries. Now this is kind of like, it's becoming a new alternative for our study, like I agree. We are kind of like considering this as a new alternative where we can offer this to our patients before we do any kind of incisional surgery and also like, I would have no second thoughts if the patients are pseudopachic. But because like of the findings that we have, especially progression of cataracts, even the patients are in their cataract age group, it remains like we need to be a little more cautious and to have more data on this point. So have you changed your practice patterns, especially any pearls that when you're selecting this kind of patients who are undergoing micropulse now? You're asking me. Yeah, Sandy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so definitely pseudophagic patients. I mean, there's no, there's no question. Um, mm -hmm. I do have some pause with uveitic patients. Um, mm -hmm. I, I have done the, this on a few, but I do worry about the risk of CME and re, re, um, um, rehashing or re, reinciting their inflammation. So. Um, at one patient who has uh, juvenile um, idiopathic arthritis and uh, associated uveitis, I had her do Remicade right before we did the laser. Of course, she was not, she had already had some incisional surgery. We were using this as kind of a um, adjunct to that. Um, but uh, definitely pseudophagic patients. Um, I use this a lot on patients who I know are not going to do well with incisional surgery, but need the surgery. So 
perfect example, patients uh, who are special needs, um, nursing home, you know, difficult to care for afterwards, um, potentially not in a good environment um, to, to have uh, an open wound like a TRAB. Um, I, I sort of bring this technology as, as an option to the forefront. And I do have to say family members of these patients are always very relieved to be able to have their loved one have a surgery, quote unquote, or something that brings their IOP down um, and they don't have to worry about um, a lot of postoperative pain, a lot of postoperative care, um, infection, things that, you know, you have to worry about with even a cataract surgery. So um, I have uh, a lot of these patients that I'm doing primary on are patients that are not good candidates for incisional surgery. Um, and lastly, there's the, the occasional per person who's been burned by a uh, trab that's gone awry or a tube that's gone awry in one eye and they need something done in their other eye but they are very wary of incisional surgery and they are um, amenable uh, to having something like this done because uh, the stigma of incisional surgery is not there and you know if you think about needing to take someone back to the operating room to re-op because they are hypotenuse or they have tube exposure it's a, a hard sell, but to tell a patient who they need maybe a repeat micropulse, it's never a hard sell because, you know, comfort-wise, the patient um, is very comfortable, and they don't think twice if they need to have it repeated, at least in my experience. I don't know if you would agree. Yes, I agree with you. You know, the main thing that you touched is the quality of life of these patients, you know, uh, where they are situated especially in uh, you know, uh, nursing homes or patients who, who can't take care of themselves, they need some sort of like assistance. You know, papers which came, which published uh, from Murphys, like, you know, which said even in spite of having this kind of incisional surgeries, one third of these patients kept progressing irrespective. So uh, things like ocular pain, probably, you know, difficulty for near focusing, those are all the morbidities that gets, you know, gets into their activities every day. So uh, that's a major problem. And if you look at the TBT study, almost like 47, 44% of AGV and almost like 39.4% of barbered group had some sort of like involvement where they had diplopia, some cosmetic issues, but we always kept saying like they need to be continuously monitored, you know, over time. Mm -hmm. And that's one major disadvantage when you consider, but this is, something that it needs to be considered and that, that should be offered as a first alternative when you are mm -hmm. going to go into the incisional surgeries. I agree. Mm -hmm. So question, um, do you routinely do a, a preoperative macular OCT on your patients prior to uh, micropulse? And then secondly, I'm wondering if you could describe your postoperative regimens for the attendees on the call. Cheryl? Yeah, so um, because like you're picking up patients for glaucoma surgery, so all these patients, <clears throat> irrespective, they have everything. Uh, their vision, intraocular pressure is not just one, at least like two or three sessions of intraocular pressure measurements, they will have their T-max. And of course, the visual fields, both central 24-2 uh, in case if there is advanced uh, glaucoma, we get the 10-2. And in terms of imaging, we also have the stereo disc photos and also the OCT, OCT of macula, optic nerve, and also the ganglion cell count. Uh, invariably, all, all these are taken into preoperative consideration to make a decision uh, whether what, what kind of surgery this patient should be offered. So patients who are really progressing, and if you look at the visual fields from last couple of like two to three, and if they are losing more, uh, more of uh, vision, especially in the central or paracentral scotoma, we kind of like think towards incisional surgeries. And these are the patients that we've been offering. So preoperative, of course, we, we get invariably uh, the macular OCT. And most of the time, patients who had some sort of like abnormality, like in our study, who had some sort of like an ERM or a previous history of CME, tend to have recurrent CME in those patients. So it's better to have a baseline so baseline uh, macular OCT. In terms of postoperative care, I think like 
everybody differs. Like uh, even during the surgery, even the anesthesia is, uh, is different. So uh, I, uh, my group here uses propofol. And then before they come into the operating room, they gave a little bit of fentanyl or versal. And then it takes less than two, three minutes for the entire procedure. So at the end of the procedure, we just give them a little bit of decadrant and then bring them out. And then I give them uh, Pred Forte for like four weeks, four, three, two, one, tapering it for four weeks and then stop them. And then I see them post-op day one, week one, and then in six weeks, just to make an assessment of their vision, intraocular pressure, their inflammation, and all those things uh, in the first uh, six weeks. And most of the patients that I have seen uh, being doing it since the last four or five years, what I've noticed is patients fail. Uh, like, you know, if they fail, they fail within the first three months. So that's why uh, this post-operative period in the first three months, I, I kind of like watch them uh, very closely. You know, uh, it's all, sometimes it's tailor-made, like, you know, depending on how old is the patient, what's the comorbidities they have, and all those we look into uh, before offering any type of anesthesia. In fact, today, I have, because there was a patient who, who was allergic to Profofol, we kind of like uh, did it under just fentanyl and then a little bit of, you know, uh, they gave some uh, gas and you know, nitrous oxide, and then we, we were able to finish it within two minutes. And the patient was very comfortable uh, uh, during during the entire procedure and post-op. So, Sandy, I, I, I definitely know that you do something very differently than what I do, right? <laughs> um, I I do. So, um, I, I agree. If somebody is in the glaucoma clinic, they've already had um, the standard 24-2 and OCP of the um, parapapillary NFL and also the macula. So that's usually done. Um, I'm not getting a dedicated MAC OCT um, that the retina box get, but I at least have the ganglion cell count that you can change the window if needed. And if obviously there's a CME, you can pick it up even on the uh, ganglion cell analysis um, cross-section. Uh, in terms of the uh, surgery, I was doing a retrobulbar in the beginning. Um, I tried to do away with the retrobulbar and just do MAC anesthesia. And I did find I was having a lot of people um, uh, still stimulated and moving. So, um, and I don't have it on me right now, but I'm happy to share with the group um, what we've been doing on uh, definitely the past uh, 100 or more, maybe 200 cases, um, which is, a, a mixture of ketamine, ketamine, fentanyl, versed, and propofol. And the ketamine um, actually just kind of uh, really that addition gets people uh, very comfortable and uh, um, I, has negated my need for a retrobulbar um, for a, a long time. So I do that same thing with everybody. Um, I don't do general anesthesia and I have this ketamine cocktail um, that I've been using pretty consistently um, uh, with the help, obviously, of the, the nurse anesthetist and anesthesiologist. Um, in terms of the post-operative management, I just do topical PRED uh, four times a day for a week, two times a day for a week, and then I stop it. And I see people uh, post-operatively the same way uh, Cyril does, but uh, I because there has been such little inflammatory response universally um, in the patients I was doing even early on. Um, I stopped seeing them routinely at the one day visit, the post op day one visit. Um, that, of course, when we start our prospective studies is going to change and we'll be seeing them post op day one just for study purposes. But from a practice standpoint, because, and it's only because patients were so. Um, uh, the inflammation was so little on post-op day one that I felt to just negate that visit and just go to the one-week visit and decide whether to taper the thread based on the inflammation then. You both described that within the study you were treating patients who had already had prior incisional glaucoma procedures. 
what is your technique for, say, avoiding or treating over a prior failed trabeculectomy site or tube shut? Do you avoid those areas or do you actually still utilize that geography and treat over them? Um, so, I, I think with them, oh, go ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, no, no, go ahead, Sandy. Uh -huh. I, I just wanted to say with the, with the newer probe, which has a recess tip, I don't think this will apply as much, um, but the, um, uh, the probe that was used in our study does have a bit of a, um, a protuberant nipple-like uh, tip um, that could lacerate the conjunctiva. So um, I was avoiding the tube for that reason. Um, so just skipping over that and continuing on. But with the TRAB, if it was flat and non-functional, I'd just go right over it. Um, and if it was this obviously cystic, fragile-looking TRAB, um, avoid it. And same with expression. Uh, it's the same strategy. Like, especially with the traps, if it's cystic, we want to just avoid it so that you're not going to rupture it, causing a, a cytal positive leak. Uh, but like, if it's a tenon cyst, if it's a thick cobleb, uh, it's, it's okay to uh, go over it. And then anyway, like I used to uh, give uh, a decadron at the end of the surgery. And so that kind of like uh, avoided a lot more inflammatory reaction, especially with the previously failed uh, surgeries. So, uh, but I don't see anything different in the outcomes, uh, you know, but typically I avoid those regions. Uh, but with the new probe, as Sandy was saying, uh, which is more ergonomic, and then it is like you, you can easily maneuver around this cyst and other things. Like we, I try to utilize uh, as much area as possible, and I go very slowly over it. Thank you. Uh, we have one question from the field. Do you vary the type of anesthesia depending on the glaucoma type or stage of severity? Um, like in, in my practice, no. It's everything is uniform. Uh, only certain cases, like as I was telling you, if the patient has some sort of like uh, allergic reaction to some medications, then probably we would change the uh, medications that's used to induce uh, uh, anesthesia. But otherwise, the severity of glaucoma doesn't kind of like influence me. Like I never, I never used retrobulbar, peribulbar, never so far. But like most of the time, it's just only, uh, you know, a little bit of propofol, ketam, I mean, propofol and fentanyl and Versep. And for the pain post-op management, I just ask them to take over the counter Tylenol or Advil, anything that they typically take it. I don't ask them to stop their, uh, if they're on any uh, Coumadin or anything, I don't uh, stop any kind of blood thinners pre-op. I just, uh, you know, it's the it's least risky uh, option in, in terms of like uh, pre-op uh, management. And also like I've not kind of like changed my uh, pre-operative anesthetic plan based on the severity of glaucoma. Yeah, and I agree. I would say the same thing. I was doing retrobulbars early on, um, and uh, I think I had uh, one of those days that haunted me, a monocular patient um, who lost his other eye to end up the mitis after an expression, and I was doing a uh, micropulse. Uh, he had had a couple of MIG surgeries um, in, over in Canada, and he had... Um, I did a retrobulbar, and he was on a uh, blood thinner and developed a retrobulbar hemorrhage and um, a very tight orbit. I didn't, do, I didn't need to do a, um, a canthotomy, but I did keep him around for a few hours and monitored his pressure and made sure it didn't um, get too tense. So that was a, a tense um, moment. <laughs> no doubt. Do you find any contraindications to the current MIGS procedures that are available or any other angle surgeries when it comes to micropulse? No, I don't. So uh, I don't see any contraindication, but there are studies which kind of like say, like when you are using micropulse on the conch, there is some sort of like an inflammatory reaction. And especially if you are targeting something like a trap, 
or if you are targeting some subconjunctal devices in the future, there is more risk of, of failure because of uh, the way the con just kind of like changed. But you need more uh, studies just to see how these patients react to it. Because many of the times, like these patients, after the primary uh, micropulse, like if they fail after a few years, uh, they, they went ahead and had, uh, you know, subconjunctal uh, devices or even uh, glaucoma drainage devices. I didn't have any history of failures or exposure, but uh, we can't take just one center outcomes. But that is something that we need to be a little bit careful and watch for. As far as makes, especially angle-based makes, I don't think there is any contraindications at this time, because you know, uh, you know, going forward, the visibility at the angle, if it's open angle, any type of you know, uh, trabecular uh, bypass devices, or even uh, devices that ablate a trabecular meshwork or uh, excisional goniotomy, is not a contraindication. I have no uh, problems. In fact, uh, the 12 patients who had uh, uh, cataract progression, uh, they had some sort of like an angle-based procedures when they underwent cataract excision. So it's, it's, it's not a, con a contraindication. So they were doing well after that. But uh, one point is I would be a little more cautious about the subconjunctival devices. I need more information about that. Very good. If any of our participants have any questions, please submit them through the chat app within the uh, Zoom wing. At the moment, we don't have any other uh, questions, but uh, so, this has been uh, definitely very I informative. Do, I do see a few. I do see a few here. Um, but, yeah, I think we already know, asked them. I see one in a tight orbit. Have you ever had a conjunctival dehiscence during during the procedure? Um, and I, I have not. Um, I didn't actually bring this up, and I, um, it is a huge point to make that uh, it's important to have a liquid interface while doing this procedure. Um, it is uh, going to really increase the, um, the coupling of the laser and increase the efficacy of your therapy in general. Um, I use Goniavis. Um, uh, this elastic works fine, but I use a going to this bottle that we actually, uh, since it's not a sterile procedure, we, we, we use that. And um, I just sort of flood the eye, and that also decreases that um, uh, propensity for the tip of the probe to uh, lacerate or disturb the conjunctiva. Again, with the new probe, this, uh, the tip is recessed, so you don't, uh, the, there is some capillary action where the liquid um, does uh, get sucked in, so to speak, into the pan piece. So um, you don't really need to flood the eye with a liquid interface, but you do need to dip the tip um, in some type of bony disc. So, um, uh, Cyril, I don't know if you have any conjunctival dehiscence stories. No. <laughs> no, not really. You know, that's a very good question because I treat uh, some of angle closure patients as well. Like, you know, if they're hypermetropic, if they have a tight orbit of a small uh, globe, sometimes uh, I don't use the uh, lid speculum. And then the, the other trick is to flood, you know, the, uh, the conjunctal, the treated area with plenty of uh, goniosol or any kind of like. Uh, uh, a coating agents that we use. But with the new uh, probe, that's one of the major advantage. The, it's so ergonomic, like the way that you hold it, the interface is actually not normally created with such a, like a, it comes like a cup so that it holds the, uh, uh, the goniosol in between. And then there is very less risk of lacerating the can't, even if you're, and then the other trick is to move very slowly. You know, like we, you know, though they kind of recommend I go like four or five passes, very slow passes, almost like you're stopping. And so that is the trick. And if you are in a hurry and if you don't know where you are moving, there's always a chance, you know, the older probe, but I don't foresee it like in the, uh, with the use of new probes. But it's definitely that I would recommend, uh, don't use the speculum, use plenty of uh, uh, goniosol or any kind of lubrication. And also like be slow, like, you know, just make sure that where you are moving the probe makes a huge difference also. 
So we have another question. How often and how soon do you retreat with MicroPulse? Cheryl, I'll let you take this one. You mentioned already um, uh, retreatment. Yeah, so it's actually like it's a study that we kind of like completed with collaboration from uh, Brazil, a group from Brazil. So we looked into patients who are really advanced glaucoma and they're progressing uh, like, you know, fast progresses in the sense they are losing more than 1.5 decibel of, you know, like visual field loss, like almost like more than uh, in a year. So these are the patients who are almost like at a stage where they needed some sort of like a glaucoma surgery. And so we could not wait for them to keep, still keep progressing. So what we did in this group is to like follow them up with the same strategy, post-op day one, week one, month one, and then see over a year. What we noticed is patients who didn't respond in the beginning, especially patients who are, you know, uh, thickly like are really brown pigmented iris, or like if they had some sort of like a really uh, robust inflammation, and these are the patients who failed in the first three months and the data is going to be published. And then they are the patients like who, whom we retreated the second time. And like, you know, if we didn't treat it, they, those are the patients who fail. So whatever target pressures of 20% or 30, you, you, the, drop, the pressure drops quite significantly. But in these patients who fail, they fail within first six to eight weeks uh, in this study. And uh, they are like really aggressive, severe glaucoma with really brown pigmented iris. Uh, that's what we noticed with previous inflammation, angle closure, pseudo exfoliation, previous failures of SLT. These are the candidates. We looked into who fails uh, patient. These are the characteristics of those patients. Pseudo exfoliation, previous failures of SLT, uh, old age uh, patients who had previous incisional surgeries who failed. And you know, these are all the indications. Patients who had previous retinal detachment or any retinal problems they had. So any kind of retinal issues like retinal detachment or any PRP or diabetic retinopathy which has been treated or injections that's given for uh, macular degeneration. So any kind of like retinal cause, they also have more chances. So you have to pick up these patients very cautiously. You know, like patients who, uh, you know, th these are the clue and these patients fail within the first three months. So that's the time, the characteristics of the patient. And then the timing is typically six to eight weeks, you will have a clue that these patients are failing. And I won't recommend like if it's failing, instead of whatever the baseline IOP is, if it's going beyond the baseline IOP in terms of, you know, like the inflammation and everything, I'll, I'll start preparing the patient, telling them, you know, there's very likely that this is not responding. Either you have to try, uh, you know, uh, retreat it and then see. Otherwise, I also try them for other alternatives. And what time period is that retreatment that you're offering? So like in six to eight weeks, I see them. And then within uh, that time, like within the three months period, I just go back and then retreat it. So the characteristic features, Sandy, like the older patients, pseudo exfoliation, previous SLT failures, patients with the uh, retinal detachment are patients who had previous retinal surgeries, uh, patients who had some intravitreal injections. Most of the patients, like more than 50% of this patient age group had some sort of like retinal pathology that was going on and they had some mm. sort. Of, so it's very classical, like, you know, it's very easy to pick up these patients, but typical garden variety, primary open angle glaucoma, when, they fail, they, when you retreat them, they do really well. They do really well. And then they, if they fail in six to eight weeks, they are the patients there. They need to like pick up and then start treating. And they have a good outcome if you treat them. But patients who have this kind of pathology and other characteristic features, previous failed glaucoma surgeries, retinal problems, I would be more cautious in offering this. And then we have to go enter a different direction in these patients. Right. We have another question here. How yes, soon after, yes, we do. How soon after the procedure do you start to remove medications? Um, and I, uh, I usually keep all medica topical medications on board until the first week visit, and then um, if I if there is a profound drop, start tapering them one by one at that point. Um, if somebody is on Diamox. 
uh, acetazolamide, I, I will, um, just to see what the IOP is, I will stop it after the procedure and see them at one day. Those are some of the people that I still see one day if I'm taking away the Diamox. But I pretty much topical medications keep all on board for the first week. Yeah, like my strategy is I kind of like stop the prostaglandin analog. I don't know, I have some sort of like, a, uh, like I don't know whether it's some sort of like an anxiety because prostaglandin analogs sometimes can be associated with some CME. So immediately after the surgery, I kind of like tend to stop all the prostaglandin analogs. And within a week, if they show some sort of like a response, next medication, I kind of stop is alpha agonist, primonidine or anything, I stop it. And then timolol. And then I try to keep uh, sulfonamides for some time. But if the patients are on oral diamox or anything, I stop it. That would be the first one to go. That would be the first one to go. And then the prostaglandin analogs and the alpha agonist and then beta blockers, and finally, uh, darzolamide. Usually two to three medications, they go off uh, easily, but uh, then I watch them. Uh, one week, one month, I stop it, and then I kind of look at them. Almost, if you look at our study, almost more than 60%, 70%, 70 of the patients were off, like almost 50% of their medication. So, uh, but this is the usual protocol that I use. So we have one additional question and it concerns counseling the patient prior to the procedure and kind of your talk track and do you set up the retreatments in advance before you have the procedure or is this a conversation that you're having with them post micropulse? So uh, in my patient population, so because of the experience and because of my own patient population that I've been seeing, especially referrals coming for you know, like after two, three failure incisional surgeries, those kind of patients, I kind of like prep them before I'm saying, let's try this. I know like you already tried all the incisional surgeries. This should be your, you know, let's try this. There is a possibility that this is definitely might work. And if not, we can always go back uh, to think of other options. So patients who had previous incisional surgery is one. The other group of patients I would tend to like prepare them are the, that I spoke just recently about the characteristic features, patients who are getting IVT injections. And I've noticed like patients, though it works for some time, patients who get repeated intravitreal injections, they tend to fail. There is some sort of like a pathology that's happening in the choroid. I don't know how this mechanism, how it, uh, it kind of like comes back. So those patients, I kind of like, so like, you know, possibly if this doesn't work, since you are getting injections every six to eight weeks, and we will continue to monitor you if you have an attack and if your pressure goes up, if there's anything you, you might need. So that's the second one. Previous failed multiple surgeries, incisional glaucoma surgeries, continuous IVTs, and any previous retinal detachment or any robust uh, diabetic retinopathy, anything like that. And any previous uh, severe angle closure with complete, uh, almost like more than three, you know, three quadrant sine K, these patients also don't, don't do well, this patient. So this, are, this has to be published, this patient. So these are the patients that, you know, I kind of like preen them that there might be a possibility I might repeat that. Yeah, and I, I sort of bring it up with everyone, regardless of their predisposition, that this is something that can be repeated. Um, uh, and patients actually ask a lot too, um, just while I'm bringing up the laser, can I do it again if I need to? So it seems to come up pretty regularly with, with, uh, um, most patients. So, um, kind of like with, with SLT, if I'm talking to somebody about that, I do sort of bring up right then and there that you can repeat it, uh, multiple times, not that the micropulse should be um, used in the same vein as SLT, but similar, I bring up the repeatability of the procedure. You're actually surprised many times, you know, if they respond initially, Sandy, like, you know, what I've seen is my patients kind of saying, can you try it again? This might work. <laughs> Have you seen that? Like they, they actually mm -hmm. ask them because they've underwent mm -hmm. previous incisional surgery straps and the tubes and when it fails, they want to look into options like, can we try again and then see this seems much more easier for us. So 
So, mm -hmm. you know, I've seen that also, like patient initiated discussions about repeating that. Mm -hmm. So I question when you... Oh, sorry. sorry. I was just going to say I did a micropulse on a patient who's a uh, adopted Polish, um, uh, adopted as a Polish uh, baby from an orphanage. She was a fakic. Um, she is a fakic. She's now in her mid twenties, and uh, she had tubes put in. They exposed. They were taken out. Um, she had ECP um, in a different state. While I was still uh, seeing her, she went and and had. Uh, ECP done and had a whole bunch of inflammation and actually drummed up a bunch of uh, latent cortical material that was stuck in the crevice of her um, capsular bag. It came hydrated and uh, came, came out. Um, it was not a good experience for her. Um, and uh, her pressure has been coming up in the past uh, year. So I did the micropulse. She said it was uh, obviously, so the easiest thing she's ever done, and was, you know, again, same thing. Asking, the, can she do it again? When can she do it again? If it if it goes up, if her pressure goes up again, so uh, really good success, and again, patient satisfaction. Thank you. So we're coming up on our hour for the webinar, but one more question: When you retreat, do you change your treatment technique, or do you leave it the same? Higher power and slower. <laughs> <laughs> yes, th 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 yes, that's typically uh, my strategy. Ink is a little bit higher, and then yes, more more exposure. Very good. Well, I for one would like to thank both Dr. Siminski and Dr. Raj for sharing their knowledge with this wonderful study. Uh, if you have any additional questions, you can submit them through uh, information at iridex.com, and then we will answer them for you. Uh, and we will also submit them to both Dr. Siminski and Dr. Daraj if desired. So thank you, both of you, for such a wonderful webinar this evening and for all of our participants for joining you. And good night. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Good night. Thanks. Good night. Thanks.